my screen because ah, there it is. See, it's always an awkward moment as a speaker because you feel like it's okay. I'll just talk really loud, and then the guys get it figured out, and I, you just it hurts everybody's ears. But good evening. Um, we are very thankful to see all of you here this evening with us at, uh, at our worship service. Uh, before we get started this evening, as far as our worship is concerned, there are obviously announcements that we would like to make. Uh, as always, be sure to refer to your bulletin uh, in case we miss something. Everything should be there. Uh, pay attention to our emails. Uh, if you're not getting those email blasts, please let somebody know. Um, but we did want to be sure to point out a few things. Um, that uh, first off, Richard and Melissa Conquest, their son Zach, have uh, placed membership here, uh, and that information uh, is in the bulletin as well, and all as, uh, as well as Jay and Lindsay Miles have, have asked to be recognized as members here. Uh, we also want to be sure to remind everybody that there is a, a bridal shower for Sarah Barker Cregan, uh, which is the bride elect of Paul Harris, Sunday, May the 16th, from 1.30 to 3 o'clock, behind the face on the patio. Uh, we do want to be sure to remind everybody that there are still sign-up sheets out in the foyer for the community outreach program uh, to volunteer to stock the box uh, out on, on our patio as well as a sign-up sheet in the foyer for helping prepare communion trays. Uh, there's always a need for volunteers in, in both of those capacities. As far as our prayer list is concerned, I have not been given any new updates uh, from what we announced this morning, so please be sure to refer to your bulletin for that. And we also want to offer a reminder uh, to pay attention to your emails, your bulletins, because there is a lot going on, and sometimes we can't afford to announce all all of it, but there is quite a bit going on. Uh, our classes are, are working their way back to, to being in full swing, both on Sunday mornings and hopefully soon on Wednesday nights. Uh, there is a hot Wednesday for our 6th through 12th graders. Uh, that's going to be this week. We'll eat at 545. Uh, and we'll have uh, our regular Hot Wednesday format moving on from that. And then I uh, also want to remind everybody that also on May the 16th, that is our, uh, our traditional Senior Sunday. Uh, and so that'll be an opportunity for us to recognize both our college and high school seniors. I want to go ahead and make an announcement. I know that we've put this on Facebook several times, and I think that I have everybody, but it never fails that as soon as I think that I have everybody, I have forgotten somebody. So if you have a high school or college graduate, uh, please be sure to, to get that information to me so that they can be recognized uh, as well for, for that. Am I missing anything this evening before we get started with worship? All right, if not, if you'll please bow with me as we begin. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for this wonderful day that you've given us. Thank you for uh, giving us the opportunity to, to not only live, but to gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ and to worship you, to bring praises to your name, to represent you. Uh, and dear Heavenly Father, we pray that as, as often as we are blessed with days on this earth, that we continue to represent you and live according to your will. Dear God, we pray that you be with all of those of our number that are suffering with sickness, with the loss. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that specifically you be with those that we have brought before you on our prayer list. Uh, and dear Heavenly Father, we pray that uh, we can constantly be able to reach out to those uh, to help. Uh, to encourage and to show each other the love of Christ. Heavenly Father, we pray at this time that you please forgive us when we fall short. We know that we are uh, human. We know that uh, we are not perfect, but we pray to Heavenly Father that uh, we never use that as an excuse, that we can continue to live better tomorrow uh, than we did yesterday. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for giving us those opportunities as well. Dear God, we thank you so much for your son Jesus for his example, for his sacrifice. Dear God, we thank you so much for your love, your mercy, your grace, and we thank you just for being our God. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. First song to sing will be Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. We'll sing verses 1 and 3. And we'll sing Looking to Thee, and then we'll have our scripture reading and lesson. Thank you. 
God in Christ. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices accept acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble, being disobedient to the world, and to which they also were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from, flesh, from fleshly lust, which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Logan, that was an excellent reading, and my wife elbowed me and said, why don't you just give them a few scriptures instead of giving them those long sections? So I, I, I will say, I don't know, I don't, I just assigned what the text is that night, and so it's, if you sign up for scripture reading, you're rolling the dice if you're getting a short one or a long one, but when we do have long ones, these young men have done a good, good job with it. Tonight we're in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 12, as we discuss Peter's address to what he calls the royal priesthood. I want to take just a moment for a couple of reasons. First of all, I want to invite all of our men, if you're available at 7 o'clock on Thursday, we've been having our men's bring your own breakfast and Bible study at 7 a.m., and we've had a good three weeks already, and we've been diving into the book of James and all of its practicality and enjoying a little fellowship. So if you can stop by at 7 o'clock before you go to work, or if you're retired, stop by at 7 o'clock and get up early to do it. I mean, whatever your reason or ability to do so, we have a good, good time together. So I'd like to let you know about that. Secondly, I want to thank Nathan. Uh, it's, it's very seldom in my time of preaching that I've had a youth minister that is such a skilled and accomplished preacher. And so it really is no surprise to me that he's moving to the pulpit because he did an outstanding job this morning as he has every time I've ever heard him. And so I certainly know that our loss will be the Troy congregation's gain. And uh, Nathan, you did a great job. We love you and we're sad to see you go. We are in 1 Peter chapter 2, and those words that were read to us tonight are the Lord speaking through Peter, and in essence, addressing an identity crisis among God's people. Have you ever had those conversations with your children? Those don't you know who you are conversations? I can remember having those talks when my kids were struggling with temptation. And also when they were struggling with self-worth or their own self-esteem. Also, I can remember when I thought my kids were being too prideful. You see, it applied in so many different circumstances. When Seth was struggling in sports and maybe he had a coach that he didn't think was giving him his due. He wasn't getting the playing time or he didn't get the position that he thought he deserved. Even though he felt he was working harder than somebody else then I'd have to have the don't you know who you are conversation? Son, are you the hardest working guy out there? If not, you should be. Son, don't you know who you are? You're Seth Williams. That means that you put it all on the field. You leave it all there on the gridiron or on the baseball field or on the basketball court. And you don't give in to those emotions of everybody else. When things don't go your way, then you double down and you give more than you've ever given before. And you don't complain, you work hard. That's who you are. Have you ever had those kind of conversations? 
Or how about when they're struggling with their own self-worth? I can remember when our kids would come in, and especially our girls being girls, they went through a lot because, I don't know if you know this, but junior high girls are the meanest people in the world. No offense to our junior high girls, you'll grow out of it, but wow. I used to think when we had Guantanamo Bay during the war and all that, I thought they should make the interrogators eighth grade girls. Because then, I mean, every one of those terrorists would crack under that pressure. Where did you get that turban at Kmart? I mean, you know, I mean, they're just, it's just a hard life. And so we remember, I mean, it was tough, and we'd have to have these build them up. Yeah, don't you know, baby, you're, the, you're so beautiful. Baby, you're so talented. You're so smart. And don't let what those other girls say, don't let those mean girls impact who you know you are. Don't you know who you are? Or how about maybe when your kids got a little prideful? And maybe when they weren't acting like they should and mistreating other people, and you said, don't you know who you are? That's my name you wear. And you should be better than that. You should be confident in yourself so you don't have to prove it to anybody. You should treat people with kindness and goodness and not have to brag or not have to stand above them. You see, there's all sorts of circumstances in which we have to apply the don't you know who you are conversation. And this text is a don't you know who you are lecture from God to us. And from the Father to those original readers of Peter's letter who were under great persecution who were struggling as strangers and pilgrims in the world, and who no doubt struggled with their own identity, who wondered if they would be able to persevere and make it through. And he tells them, don't you know who you are? Let me tell you who you are. So we ask the question as we read through these verses tonight, who are we? You see, we might allow how the world sees us, just like the mean girls in junior high, to impact what we think of ourselves. But the truth is, is what they think about you and I has no bearing of who we are. What matters is what we know ourselves to be and who we are in the sight of God. Regardless of their viewpoints or opinions or criticisms, in a world that has oppressed God's people and will continue to until the day he returns, we need to allow God to formulate our identity and not the world around us. Don't you know who you are? How should we see ourselves well, this passage tells us something about who we really are in Christ Jesus. You know, I've often heard, I've studied so much in regard to sociology and, and even some politics, particularly political philosophy, and I remember one professor making a statement that stuck with me. He said, a republic democracy or a democratic republic like what we live in in the United States is the worst form of government in the world, except for all the rest of them. And that stuck with me. I'm like, wow, that's interesting. And so somebody asked, well, Professor, then what's, what would be the best form of government? He said, oh, no doubt, a monarchy. And then someone asked him, what's the worst form of government? And he said, no doubt, a monarchy. Because he said, whether or not a monarchy is the best form of government in the world or the worst form of government in the world is all dependent upon who the monarch is. I mean, you understand that principle? Just think about that. Couldn't all of our problems, if we had a moral, good, loving, incorruptible king, couldn't he fix all of our problems? I mean, that would be pretty wonderful. The problem is you don't always get a moral, good, loving, and incorruptible king. 
But when you do, it's a wonderful circumstance. And the reason is this. A king, and this does apply, I promise. The reason is this. A king can't be bought because he owns everything. You see, in in our society, we talk about corruption. A king can only be corrupt because he chooses to be. He can't be coerced into corruption. Why? Because there's nothing you can offer him. He has absolutely everything. He owns everything. He is everything. Absolute power. And so that's why in one part of that equation, if he's a good monarch, it's the best system there could be. But if he's a bad monarch, it could be the worst thing imaginable. Now the reason I bring that up is because one of the stories I remember from my youth was the prince and the pauper. Did anybody ever, you probably watched the Disney version like I did with Mickey Mouse the prince who becomes Mickey Mouse the the pauper. And what that story kind of unveils is the idea of a prince who's born to royalty who gets so tired of everybody always just treating him like he's a prince and, and always saying yes to everything and never disagreeing with him. And he wants to see what real freedom is like because he feels trapped in the palace. And so he goes down and pretends to be a pauper. And then as the story progresses, and there's several manifestations of this story, but in all of them, at some point, there's some abuse taking place or some terrible deed that takes place or he's faced against the palace guards or whatever, and then he reveals who he is. I'm the prince. And then everything changes. But you see, never in that story is the prince, son of the king, going to be king, never when he's down in the streets and in the gutters and pretending to be a pauper, never does he ever really think he's a pauper. He just acts that way and he treats people well and all of that. But you see, when push comes to shove, he knows what he is. He's royalty. He's a prince. And I think what this text is trying to communicate to us is that there's a bearing, a royal bearing that we carry ourselves with when you know that you're royalty. There's a dignity. And there's a deep pride, not the kind of pride that tries to make everybody else look bad or make yourself look better than them or exalt yourself above others, but that deep confidence. If someone is true royalty, that incorruptible, powerful identity that is revealed in everything they do and everything they are. In this text, he tries to remind us that we are a royal priesthood. And he makes three points about our identity, starting in verse 4 through verse 8, where Peter says, coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God in precious You also, as living stones, are being built up to a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, erect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. They stumble, being disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed. He says, first of all, you're a royal priesthood, as he mentioned in verse 5. Why? Because we've been built upon a solid rock. We've been built upon the rock of ages. Our foundation cannot crumble. And no matter what 
the winds of the world or the rains or the snows or whatever it may be. We saw some of that during this big storm that we had not long ago, that some of the buildings in our area weren't built to handle all that snow. And they buckled under it. But you see, we don't have to worry as the people of God whether our spiritual foundation is solid enough. He said, we are solid as a rock. Our strength is built upon Jesus as an unmovable cornerstone for our faith. And of course, we trace that back to our Lord in Matthew 16, where he says to them, who do people say that I am? And they say, Elijah or one of the prophets. And Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? Peter responded, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for this has not been revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father which art in heaven. And I say that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And of course, Peter, that's a different word. That's like little stone. He doesn't say we're going to build it on Peter. He says, no, we're going to build it on the rock. And that rock is the identity of Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. So he tells him there, I'm going to build my church on something that cannot be shaken. On a truth that is more powerful than any other truth or any lie that will ever be perpetuated in this world. On a rock that cannot be moved. And that's, of course, why it tells us all throughout the Old Testament in prophecy that he's going to raise up a kingdom, this kingdom, that shall never be destroyed. And you know, we may not feel that way sometimes when things get tough and, and viruses ravage the world and, and mess up all of our routines or when we face persecution or when the government is not particularly favorable to our faith or any number of other problems that may become upon us. When there's division in the church or strife, anything that comes upon us, we can feel shaken. But the truth is, is the church of our Lord Jesus Christ has survived the Roman Empire. It survived every nation and empire and false teaching and corrupted religion. And we are still here. Amen? And the Bible tells us we always will be. Now, you and I, we have to choose if we're going to be still here. If we're going to be a part of the church. We can, in our free will, we can walk away. But the church of our Lord Jesus Christ cannot ever be destroyed. What should that tell us about who we are? We are victors. We are more than conquerors. Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 7. In the Sermon on the Mount. As he says in verse 24 through 27, Therefore, whoever hears these words of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came. And the winds blew and beat on the house. And it did not fall. For it was founded on the rock. But whoever hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, he will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat that house and it fell. And great was its fall. You see, as long as we're built upon the will and the words of God and His Son, Jesus Christ, this congregation and this people, that means you and I individually as well, we cannot fall. That's called invincible, spiritually. Oh, man can hurt us physically, but no one, no one can take away our inheritance, our reward, and our promises. Because we're built on the rock, we are strong. And Jesus sees his people as unshakable. Do we? 
do we? Sounds a lot like the conversations we've had with our children. Don't you know who you are? Which leads us to verses 9 and 10 in our text where Peter says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. He says that we are a part of a royal family. We're a royal priesthood. That we've been adopted into the family of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And that means, brothers and sisters, that although we call each other brothers and sisters, it would be just as right and just as biblical if I were to call you prince and princess. Because that's what we are. We have been made apart, but not just that. We have been chosen. He said he called you forth to this kingly life. In Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, Paul will address this in his own words when he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. He said he has adopted us, he has chosen us, he has predestined us to this life. Have you ever been chosen for something special? I, I must admit that when we were playing backyard football or dodgeball or any of those games as a kid, I just didn't want to be the last one picked. I mean, anybody else there? You remember, it, we were, it was such a, it was a cutthroat thing when you're a kid, right? I mean, you, you don't want to say, pick me, pick me, that's pathetic, right? So you don't want to do that, but you are thinking inside, pick me, pick me, please don't let me, please don't let me be the last one. And then if you're second to last, I felt pretty good about that, you know, not being the last one. But what about when you're chosen first? Have you ever noticed that the kids that were chosen first, I mean, I love my son, but I'm a little jealous of that because I was always chosen second to last and he was always growing up chosen first. And he, it wasn't a big deal to him. You know, he was, he was always just like, yeah, you know, the, you remember those kids that were chosen first? They just kind of expected it, didn't they? Because they knew who they were. They knew they were a good athlete. They knew they were good at sports. They knew they were good at the game. You see, they didn't have any issues of choose me, choose me like I did. Because pretty much they knew they were chosen. He wants us to be the ones who know that we were chosen first. You do realize that. You weren't just chosen, you know, for some random meaningless, menial thing. You, you were chosen by the King of kings and Lord of lords to be his child. You. How should we act? How should we think about ourselves? And he gave us a great responsibility. He says we're not just a royal priesthood. We're a royal priesthood. That means we've been given a noble responsibility. We're priests to this world. And that means our God has trusted us. You see, the kid that's chosen first, he's always trusted. He's always the quarterback, right? 
First one picked. Always the quarterback, always the pitcher, always the point guard. Always. Because they trust him. See, God gave us a great responsibility. But when we doubt ourselves and second guess, well, can we do this? Do we ever? I mean, what if it just, we're just so pressed down and things aren't going well? And, you know, what about the future? And what if it's not like it used to be? And all that stuff. Can you imagine the kid that's chosen first being like that? Well, I don't know if I should be the quarterback. I don't know if I should. I don't feel fully comfortable pitching. No. Because he knows who he is. And God wants us to know who we are. We are chosen. He trusts us. He believes that we can do it. Do we? Do we? And then verses 11 through 12. Peter gives the last thing he wants us to know about who we are. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and as pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they observe glorify God in the day of visitation. He says, not only do I want you to know that you're solid as a rock, not only do I want you to know who you are, you're a royal priesthood, but I want you to know that you are better than this world so act like it you're better than this world you're my children you're royal priests act like it finally we see that he considers us as noble and high not just of birth but of character we are his children and he trusts us to conduct ourselves as such. And you might say, well, preacher, that's the problem because I still fail and I fall short. And I think that maybe even in that we don't see it right. Because you see, my children failed and fell short. But I have the three finest children in the world, in my opinion. And I'll tell you, it wasn't so much that I saw them as failures. I saw them as not living up to their potential. Do you see the difference? Because there's a difference. You see, when you fall and fail and fall short, he has this conversation, just like I had this conversation with my kids and you may have had this with them, when he says, why are you acting like those around you? Why are you living like the world? Why are you joining in with those pagan lusts, abstain from all that stuff. Have conduct honorable. Know who you are. You're better than that. Live like it. Don't you know who you are? You see, it can be so easy to forget when you've been in the streets with the paupers for so long, it can be easy to forget that you belong in a palace. It can be easy to forget that the robes that you wear are not your permanent garments, that these rags of this world, they're not that beautiful, white, pure garments that are prepared for us. It's hard to believe that the dust on our head is not the crown that waits us. You see, we got to make sure that we don't let the circumstances in which we live cause us to forget who we really are. Solid as a rock. Royal priests and better than the world. Now tonight, there's two ways that this lesson could perhaps impact 
one of you who are listening. There might be someone here tonight that you have not yet been adopted into the family of God. Here's the thing. It's not because God doesn't want you as one of His royal children. It's that you haven't accepted that invitation. And it does take leaving your old life of rags and of sin behind, and that's called repentance when we change our lives and change our heart and decide to live for Him, live better than the world. That's repentance. And we confess Him before men and say, He's my Father and I'm His forevermore. And then we're adopted into His family when we're baptized in this watery grave of baptism and that old pauper is left behind and all that remains is the new life of His prince or princess. You see, that invitation is open to you right now. Change your last name. Oh, you'll still keep it. But you'll, I guess we could all hyphenate it, couldn't we? Carrie Williams hyphen Christian. And then there may be someone here tonight that you are a child of the King. You have your own white robes waiting for you. You have your own crown engraved with your name. but you've forgotten who you are. If you need to change anything tonight, please don't wait. Remember who you are. And come right now as we stand and as we sing. down front immediately following the services on the front row someone will be here to serve you we'll have our closing prayer at this time let us pray heavenly father we thank you for this wonderful day of worship we thank you father for your church and what it means to us father we we love you and May we always keep you the center of our lives. 
Father, we know that there are many that are sick in the hospital. Be with those. And we know that you are the great physician. You put your hand upon them. Father, again, thank you for all that you do for us and the many blessings that you give us. And most of all, thank you for sending your son, Jesus. His name I pray. Amen.